Evening, ladies and gents. My name is Simon Brown. Uh, doing the intro this evening, not doing the presentation. So, Sean van der Berg, I don't think he needs a heck of introduction. He's done power hours for us before. All yours. I'm head of client education at PSG Wealth. Been with PSG going on 17 years now. Been in the market since 1988. Um, many of you, I think some, uh, I've met some of you. Um, those of you know my background, I used to be in, in the hospitality industry. Um, I knew nothing about the stock market. My very first share I ever bought was Spur. When Spur was listed on the market in 1988, I didn't know there was a crash in 1987. So I was a complete novice. I didn't know you could sell a share. I held it for two years. Uh, at that, that point in time, my life savings was 6,500 rand. Uh, Spur came to the market at 65 cents. I bought 10,000 shares. Two years later, they were trading at 14 rand. Then someone told me they actually can sell them. That's how I started. So that's my background, and obviously over the years I've learned more about the market, and I've done a lot of courses, read a lot of books, and that's where I'm now today. Okay, so first of all, I want to say thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule for being here. Secondly, to the JSC for giving me the opportunity, and also to Simon, uh, and the guys from Just One Lap. I really appreciate the opportunity again. So, th before I get started, um, I'll ask you a silly question. Show of hands, how many of you would call yourself a normal investor? Okay, it is a trick question. Okay. <laughs> okay, as Simon said, uh, we're not rational, we're emotional. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a trick question. So, um, to get into it, you know, th this, is, this is a quote here investors are normal, not rational. It's from a person called Maya Stackman. He's a professor of uh, finance at the Santa Clara University. And his focus or his research is on behavioral finance. When I told Simon I'm going to talk about behavioral finance, he says, whoa, Pandora's box. So those of you that know about behavioral finance, and those of you who don't know about it, don't worry about it. I'm not going to go into too much detail. It's a watered-down version, uh, very, very high level. <laughs> okay. So um, when we talk about... Oh, here's my notes. When we talk about... Um, investors not being normal, let me clarify what I mean by that. And I said it was a trick question in the sense that um, there's no such thing as a normal investor. Okay, we're emotional, we act emotionally, we are rational. Okay, um, so my objective tonight with this presentation is twofold. After this presentation, I want you, first of all, to be aware of your emotions, okay, that you can plan for it and, and, and act on it and do something about it, that's number one. And number two, just to give you some options, so you can make more informed, better decisions. Um, ultimately, I call it SWAN. You can sleep well at night. You have this peace of mind. So that's my objective with, with tonight's presentation. Um, but uh, getting to the, another little quote here. And this is a quote from Adu. I hope I pronounced his surname right. Adu Yukain Laiken. He's the author of a book called, what was it again? Uh, well for All. He says, when money... Uh, realizes that it's in, a good, in good hands, it wants to stay and multiply in those hands. So, that's the next question, and uh, no, you don't have to stick up your hands. How many of you um, are investing correctly? <laughs> okay. What I mean by that is, you know, we talk about gambling and we talk about investing. And just show your hands. You know, no, you can't show your hands. Also, participation. Who are the investors? Who are the traders? Okay, we've got more investors than traders. Who's both? Okay, who's not sure? Okay, cool. So I just know my audience a bit better. So, you know, we talk about gambling, we talk about investing. Gambling is fun. You know, it's entertainment. entertainment. Um, yes, you can, make, you can get rich, uh, but the odds are against you. Would you agree with that? Okay. Um, that's why the casinos are so profitable. So the odds are, odds are against you. But saying that, investing, you know, are you investing correctly? So, investing is not supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to be uh, a short term. It's supposed to be long term. And also, um, we talk about um, being boring. I read, I read a quote once from Warren Buffett. It says, like, watching paint dry. Now, that's what, what investing should be like. But saying that, you know, you can, as an investor, become rich. It just takes time and obviously a bit of luck. Okay. Um, but talk to any successful investor, and they'll say to you that it's not about the buying and the selling. It's giving the investment opportunity to prove itself. 
And I think that, is, uh, that made a lot of sense to me when I first read that quote. Giving the investment opportunity to prove itself. Okay, so that's a bit of some background. Um, so here's the problem. What is the current position? Now, according to conventional um, financial theory, you know, investors are supposed to be rational and we're supposed to be logical. Now, we talk about uh, uh, the, the, the theoretical models. We talk about the capital asset pricing model. I'm not going to get into too much detail on that. Basically, you're looking at the relationship between your expected return and the risk. And you as a shareholder or a, as an investor, you're looking at two, two ways of being, being rewarded. You're looking for um, your time, um, what do they call it, time value, time value, um, gone blank now, time value return versus, uh, versus risk. That's uh, what you're looking for in that capital uh, asset model. And then some of you might have heard of this EMH, Efficient Market Hypothesis. And then when I first read this, when I first read about this years ago, my background, I'm a technical analyst. I look at the charts and that. Now, the whole thing about, about the efficient market hypothesis is that they believe that you can't beat the market. Okay? And a lot of you are going, whoa, okay, I can beat the market. So they believe that don't waste your time looking for undervalued shares. Don't waste your time trying to predict the trends. In other words, throw out the fundamental analysis, throw out the technical analysis. So that's when we talk about conventional um, financial theory. Now, we're talking about uh, financial, uh, sorry, uh, behavioral finance, and, uh, and basically we're looking at combining, it's a, it's a new field of research, combining what they call uh, the conventional uh, uh, theory with the psychology and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. We're looking at cognitive, the way you, you gain knowledge, and, the, and you're looking at your your mindset and all that kind of stuff. Is that kind of the combination of those two things? So the idea tonight, we talk about the current position and we talk about emotions. So here we go. Now we can go from being sad to happy to being frustrated to being shocked, um, being, being, uh, being uh, scared of the market. And we always talk about emotional roller coaster. The two biggest enemies on the share market is greed and fear. Okay. And I'm going to talk a lot about emotions tonight. So it's, it's nice when you're making money. Okay, everybody likes it. We're, we're making money and I hope it goes on forever. With the volatility on the market right now, we're the other side of the coin. We also started to lose money. And then also, also uh, the, the story gets to, we, we start making rational decisions. We start selling at the wrong time. Or we get the situation where we have indecision. And I, was, I, was read, I read something on a, on a website called InnovativeWealth.com. And it was quite interesting when I saw this. They said, back in the 1960s, people, the trend has changed over the years where people are not holding on to the investments as they used to. Back in the 1960s, they used to have, the average holding period for stocks was up to eight years. As of 2010, what do you think is, what, what do you think is the average holding period? It's dropped down to six months. And I thought, wow. So that's where this, this whole gambling uh, uh, scenario comes in. People have this mindset, and, and obviously that's been affecting the, the, the investment performance. So when we talk about, um, I'm going to talk about six bad habits, and I'm going to talk about, about six or seven good habits. So to start off, we talk about a bad habit number one. Our brains lead us on the wrong path. And that's the whole thing about behavioral finance. We're supposed to be rational, but we're actually irrational. We're emotional. So... This is a graph of the S&P 500 over the last 15 years. Um, now we're talking about, I'm just taking it from 50,000, from 100,000 to uh, over the last 15 years. But we know the market moves up and down on supply and demand, more buyers and sellers. Okay, but you understand the market moves on sentiment. It's how people feel about the, the fundamentals, about future prospects. So yeah, we've got the market moving up. Investors are feeling positive, moves a bit higher. We're getting more confident. We have a bit of a dip. Don't worry, the trend is still there. Market has a nice little rally. Uh, we're, feeling, we're feeling thrilled. Uh, you go to a bribe, people are talking about the market, and you think it's time to get in. There are a friend of yours that bought a share, and two weeks later, he bought a Ferrari. You feel, yeah, this is the way to go. Okay, so the top of the market, the sentiment is euphoria. You rush out and go buy the stocks. We buy at the top of the market. 
Next, a few weeks later, the market starts pulling back, some profit taking. You're a bit surprised. You think, oh, what's happening here? But don't worry, it's long term. Um, it dips a bit further. You feel a bit more nervous. Okay, we have this little dead cat bounce. Have you heard of a dead cat bounce? Okay, a little false signals there, and your hope goes for a dash. Market drops a bit further, more worried, and ultimately we get down to the bottom of the cycle, and we're panicking, and we sell. So we buy high, and we sell low. That's what they call contrarian investment gone wrong. <laughs> okay, so now you're holding. Okay, you must consider, okay, I'm, I might uh, not sell, but let me hold. Um, and the market recovers a bit. Um, and th this, by the way, you can see the average cycle is between five and seven years. Okay, the market, uh, the bottom of the market, most, most uh, investors are feeling a bit uh, uh, defeated. The market bounces a bit higher. We're putting our toe in the market. I saw a thing on Facebook the other day, long toe going to the water because the water's so cold. Um, so we're feeling a bit more cautious. The market goes a bit higher, and so we, the cycle gets repeated. Okay, so emotions is our biggest problem in the market. We're buying high and, and, and selling low. That's number one. So the idea is that, um, and also, and I know, who are the long-term investors? This is a show of ads. When I say long-term investors, we say five years plus. Okay, cool. If you have bought and held, okay, so first of all, you're not going to go through this emotional roller coaster. It won't affect you as bad. But if I bought it at 100,000, and now it's 2,500, 250,000, a buy and hold strategy would give me 125%. Big difference about buy and hold strategy. So, yes, along the way, I could have hedged myself and all these other things, um, but just be on the right side of the market. Go to number two, bad habit number two. Our brains think it's good at investing. This is especially for the unit trust investors, where we're chasing past performance. There's that, that famous disclaimer of, of everything. Past performance does not guarantee future performance. Okay. So, the problem with this is, is overconfidence. I'm overconfident as, a, as, a, as an investor. Um, I'm trying to predict the, the future outcomes. How many of you predicted the outcome of Brexit? How, much were, how many of you were spot on? That you know they're going to leave? The polls were wrong, so most, most of us were wrong. It was a total surprise, and that's obviously why the market tanked. So this is trying to predict what's going to happen on the market. Overconfident, overconfident investors also are undiversified, number one, and number two, are susceptible to volatility. And obviously this leads them to taking more risks, number one. Number two, not being diversified, okay, failing to be diversified, or your eggs in one basket, and also trading too often. Now this little graph at the bottom here shows you five quintiles. The more you trade, okay, the more you trade, the less we earn. So here's a scenario, the S&P 500 index fund, that's what it performed at, 18%. So if you trade it just once, so this is all about, think about low turnover. I trade once, I'm in line of the market. Okay, trade twice, I'm slightly, uh, my net performance, my, my net return is slightly lower. Trade three times, but look what happens if you trade more than five times, this is what happens. Your performance is at least 50% lower compared to a buy and hold strategy. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the, the second bad habit. We try and, uh, we're overconfident. And uh, we're chasing past performance. We look at, uh, yeah, geez, NASPAS was at 500. Uh, it's gone to, to 2,000. It's going to go there again. Yeah. Number three, our brains do not allow how to handle new information. Now, this is an example where we're looking at a, a, a fund. This is an investing value fund. And uh, there was nothing wrong with the fund manager, investing fund manager. Just the problem is that he was too much exposed to gold. He was increasing his exposure to gold, gold mining shares and that. Um, and we had always eggs in one basket. PC Asset Management saw this and thought, okay, it's got, you know, we're going to underperform the market, and you'll see on the next slide. And they switched. They switched from uh, Investec Value Fund, which is very much exposed to gold at that point in time, and they switched into Kahisu uh, Equity Alpha. But ultimately what happened is they outperformed by 30% by just making that decision. So, so the whole idea is that a lot of people hold on to their losers. When it comes to trading, I always say, you know, you want to cut your, cut your, uh, uh, your weeds and water your flowers. A lot of us do the opposite. We make a 10% gain. We're happy with that. You know, the old saying, never, no one's ever cried taking a profit. We take our 10%, going back to my nice pass again. I know some people have bought it 500 Rand and they sold it 800. They were happy. How do you think they felt when it was at 2,000? 
Okay? So the idea is that you want to cut your losses quickly and let your profits run. So in this situation, they decided switching to Kahisa, uh, as I say. They were more diversified and uh, they were more, better positioned to take advantage of the upturn in the economy. So you can see on the next slide, yeah, as I say, they were underperforming. Okay, so then we switched. So bottom line, people had held on to old information. They still did okay. You can see we st they still did okay. You know, uh, 21, 20, what was it? Uh, 19, sorry, 19 percent. They still did okay, but uh, compared to 32, the guys that switched over to new information did far much was far better. And that's the point of this of this of the slide here. Okay, so that is the third bad habit. Holding on to, on to, not holding on to new information. A fourth brand, and this is where I find this is very interesting. Where you're on a line, you've got all this information. You've got all this data, you've got all this books and information. And you've got the, the, the media giving you all this information. Uh, and then your financial plan. But it's not overlapping. Everything's not in, in place. So the problem is, we're looking for information that agrees with our decision. It's what they call anchoring. You know, the more, the more information I get that right, that's, that's, my decision was right, I feel better. The problem with this is that we're going to use it for future decisions. And that's where things go wrong. Okay? So the, the investment returns versus the investor, re the, the investment returns versus the investor returns creates a gap. And that's what they call the behavioral gap or the behavior gap. Okay? That's where we need to overlap. Everything needs to be a, a much better um, overlapping. So that's our fourth floor bad habit. Our fifth bad habit is we do not like to lose. Now, how many of you like to lose? Now, I got to a stage now where I say I'm, I'm either a winner or I'm a learner. I never lose. <laughs> Different way of looking at things. But anyway, the whole idea is that the reluctance to accept a loss can be quite costly. So you might have a, a loss in your portfolio. You, you, one of your investments are down 20%. Uh, the ideal situation is, as I said just now, cut your losses, move on. A lot of us do now is we start second guessing the market. I'm right, the market's wrong. Have you guys been in that situation? <laughs> okay. So we cannot help but think that the market might bounce back. So we have this little dead cat bounce. See, I told you the market's going to recover. We don't know it's a dead cat bounce at that point in time. The market bounces back. I feel great. The whole thing of this bad habit is this illusion of control. I think I can control, uh, I have an influence over events that I do not have control over. That's the problem with this. This is where, you, where I always say hope is not a strategy. Okay. More information does not equal better decisions. It's what you do with the information. That's what's important. So that we have a situation where we either overestimate our knowledge, we underestimate the risk, or we exaggerate our ability to control this situation. Okay. So that's, a, as I say, the fifth bad habit. And our last little bad habit... This is where we're chasing, not, not chasing performance in this situation, this is chasing the, the trend, the, fa the flavor of the month. Okay? Um, the, the market's changing, there's a lot of risk in the market, so you're, changing, you're adapting your strategy to the market. That's number one. So it's a lot of fear-based strategy. Or you follow the herd. Everybody else is doing the same thing, so you see what everybody else is doing, and uh, well and bold, we're following the noise. The noise is the media. I call it the noise. Okay? Uh, and that's where we, we focus on, on, the, on, the, on the greed. This scenario, we're talking about a buy and hold strategy versus a, a performance chasing strategy. So you might say, okay, I want to focus on large caps value stocks. I want to focus on large cap growth stocks. My strategy always, I like to blend some, some value and some growth stocks in my portfolio. But the flavor of the month might be the large blend. Market changes and you switch into mid cap blends and whatever the case, mid cap value. That chopping and changing the whole time, you can see the other performance with that kind of strategy. Okay. By the way, this presentation I hear is being recorded. You guys will be able to have to be able to review this and you can see those small little numbers in more detail. So those are the six bad habits. Okay. What's our deal position? So we know we're talking about seven good habits. The idea is that, yes, you want to focus more on the good habits and improve on your bad habits, ultimately making more money, as I said. Gives you that peace of mind so you don't have to worry about your finances, but you can be able to be in a situation where I call sleep, swan. Sleep well at night. 
Okay, I love that kind of strategy. We don't have to worry about your, your financial situation. So this is where I've stolen um, the idea from Stephen Covey's book, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Have you, have you read that? Anybody read it? Cool. So good habit number one: begin with the invest, with the the uh, end in mind. So this is where we suggest, now PSG Wealth, we are an advisory firm. So the idea there is that, um, let's get the right spot here again, that uh, uh, we believe that the first stop is that you should go to, get exp ex go to the expert or the specialist. That's our first example. Okay? You're getting sick. For example, you're feeling sick. What do you do? Are you going to go to your hairdresser and ask for, for advice? Are you going to go to your taxi driver to ask for advice? Or are you going to go to the doctor? Okay, so this is, where we, this is our PhD's view, that get advice. Clients who have an advisor are happier with their investments, are wealthier, are more engaged with their finances, have more certainty and control over their financial future. That's one factor. Okay, so investor that has an advisor, the time spent worrying is, th if you don't have an advisor, the time spent worrying about money is three times more than not having an advisor. Okay, this is all from a website called Behavioral Gap. All that to do with behavioral finance. Yeah. So that was investor, uh, the um, good investor number, uh, good, good habit number one. Good investment number two, it'd be proactive. Start early. Now, this is where you talk about the magic of compounding. Well, um, Albert Einstein spoke about the eighth one of the world. The two kinds of investment, uh, two kinds of uh, interest, simple interest versus compound interest. So, we talk about uh, investing a thousand rand at 10%. So, like simple interest, every, uh, 10 a 10% of thousand rand every year, 100 rand. Over 25 years, 25 times 100, 2,500 plus my initial investment, 3,500. Okay? Compound interest, and the big difference between the two of them is that I've got interest on interest. And that's what makes the market, uh, what makes it so powerful. Yes, 10,835. It's more than three times more with compounding interest. So the idea is that don't wait for retirement, start early. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here. Investment number three, and this is where I believe that financial advisor. Is a big benefit. Not only what I said just now, put first things first. Um, so, um, uh, beginning with the end in mind, sit down and, and it works out your, your outcomes. This is putting those priorities, those outcomes, all those little lines is an outcome. One pool of funds for all your investments doesn't help. Okay, the idea is that, yeah, and I use the example of a male, a male might have two main investment objectives my next car, my next holiday, and maybe my retirement. Women, on the other end, are different. They're worried about the children. They're worried about uh, the parents. We talk about the, the uh, uh, sandwich generation. When you're right in the middle, you have to worry about children and your parents. Um, wo women are also worried about education for the children. They're worried about um, housing, maybe the next holiday, things like that. But the point is, it's term. the outcomes on the one side and the other side is term. What is most important for you when it comes to your investment? Okay, where do you want to go? What is your priorities? Prioritize your priorities. So the idea here is that you know, a five-year financial objective versus a 30-year financial objective. What's most important for you? Okay. Um, and what, by the way, PSG we're launching from tomorrow that you can actually label. You can actually they have this thing called a naming convention where you can have a unit trust fund for my next car, my unit trust fund for my overseas holiday, my unit trust fund for uh, my children's education. So the, the, the idea is that don't have all your funds in one basket for, for your, your outcomes. Just that, that, that's the idea, to split it up like that. Okay. Number four, and that came, came back to what I spoke about term. The higher the risk... The higher the potential returns or the higher the potential risk, okay, the, the longer your investment term. And that's where a financial advisor is also very, very uh, important. A lot of us don't think about that, the term. So it's a trade-off between risk and, and return. Okay. Um, if I remember, there was another point I wanted to make here. Was. Yeah. 
So the idea here is coming back to your to yeah, my goal is to make ten percent. My need is to make ten percent return. But I'm in the, in, the, in, the, in the money market. I'm only getting seven percent. So that's where the financial advisor will give you the right advice for the outcome linked with the um, with the, uh, the the term. <coughs> so the idea is that you know. Again, come back to our aspect just about value investing and growth investing. You want to be in a situation where the risk, you know, the biggest risk on the market is that we're going to underperform relative to inflation, number one. Number two is that we're not meeting our, our investment objectives. So the idea is that fitting is all together. And I hope you guys see this. I'm trying to show you that all these things fit together. One slide slides into the slides into another one. All those objectives fit together. The, four, the fifth example, that's why I asked you just now, who are the traders, who are the investors? Remember I did this little, little tick for you guys? We talk about, I'm not talking about gambling, we're talking about speculating and the traders. Trading, we talk, at PSG we say trading is anything less than three months. Investing more longer term, more smooth approach. Trading, more volatile, more choppy performance. Investing smoothed out, but this is more longer term, one year plus. Okay, I asked you to say, who are the long term investors? Gone are the days of 20 years plus. We're talking about three years plus. Okay. So that's important also with your decisions. When you make a decision, your outcomes, your risk, the, 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 your tax implications, all those kind of things you have to take in consideration. So it's investing in what you know. When I first started out in the market, as I say, I specialized in the beverage and hotel sector. Those, day, those of you that were in the market those days were at uh, Sunbop and Interleisure and Transun. Can you guys remember that? I specialized in the beverage and hotel sector, and then from there I diversified out. I became a specialist and then a generalist. But investment in what you know, tied up your, your, your investments with your term and your outcome. And I think that's where it becomes more powerful. But also be understanding that there's risk and there's opportunity. Now we say if it's too good to be true, it's not true. <laughs> okay. Does that make sense on that? And then the last one is synergize. This is where I believe a financial advisor will sit down and look at your future financial needs. And this is where we have this perception versus reality. A, we're not on the same page. So the idea is that we have this perception about risk versus returns versus time versus reality. Sitting down with your financial advisor, the idea here is that what you may think you may need and what you actually need, you're going to have a serious wake-up call. So you want to leverage off the skills of the financial advisor as well as his knowledge. Okay. And the last one, and this is for those of you that are still, that are direct investors, and I'm a firm believer in this, and I haven't stopped learning about the market. Sharpen the saw. You know, if you, had a, if you were given three hours to cut down a tree, what are you going to do? You start chopping straight away? The right way of doing it is spend the first two hours sharpening that saw and take one hour to chop down the tree. So when I talk about sharpening the saw, gain the knowledge, gain the experience, do the courses. Um, you know, on Simon's website, there is a wealth of information there. You guys know it. You've been there all the time. Um, from an advisor point of view, keep in contact with your advisor. You know, a good advisor will phone you to keep in contact with you, but I always like to be proactive and be in contact with my advisor. But from PSG's point of view, uh, we keep you informed. We have regular investment updates, regular research seminars. You have access to the fund managers and things like that. I do webinars on a, on a weekly basis. I do it every Wednesday. Uh, webinars discussing a wealth of different topics. Um, we have a thing called My PSG. You have one single portal to have all your investments in one place. And then obviously also using social media. That's another way of keeping, uh, keeping our uh, people informed through Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, etc. So those are the seven good habits. Sense to you guys so far? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So we've spoken about six bad habits. We've spoken about s seven good habits. How do we get there? What do we propose tonight? So how can PSG Wealth help you? So first of all, you can do it yourself. So uh, we give you that choice. You can do it yourself, do it, do it, do it yourself route, uh, DIY, or I call it DIT, do it together. 
do it together with your financial advisor. And from a financial advisor's point of view, we give you a wide range of choice in the sense that we have single manager and multi-manager funds. We offer you uh, share portfolio solutions. We offer you a host of other investment instruments. Unit trusts, RAs, endowments, tax-free investments, all those kind of things on, on the retirement side. On the equity side, equities, CFDs, single stock futures, currency futures, index futures, uh, what else am I missing? Offshore, everything's in one place. But from a financial advisor's point of view, that wide range of choice, number one, he has access to a lot of tools. Now this I find useful. He's got, a, he's got a, a, a calculator, all those kind of things to help you make more informed decisions, um, financial need analysis, portfolio planning, charting tools. He also has flexible technology that can upscale the technology for you. As I say, there's a host, you can do it yourself, okay? You don't need a financial advisor. We give you that choice, but through one platform, it's your choice, okay? Why PSG Wealth? Over the years, our PSG Asset Management have, award, have, have um, achieved a lot of uh, awards. Um, our platform itself has won a lot of awards. We've won Stockbroker of the Year, uh, 2011, 2012, 2013. The last uh, few years, we've always been in the top three. Um, wealth Manager, um, we just came second now. Uh, the Wealth Manager, top banks and the, and the Wealth Managers in the country. So that's what we offer. That's where we're coming from. Okay. So guys, I hope it made a bit more sense to you that we're there to help you. Um, there's, a, so, there's a wealth of information out there. You're not alone. You can do it yourself. Or the, 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 the ideal way would be, go, would be to go through an advisor. So. Thanks, Sean. Ladies and gents. Yeah, clap away. <laughs> Ladies and gents, thanks very much for your time this evening. Drive safe.